Namaste. Welcome to our 25th talk on the Bhagavad Gita. We are still in chapter 5. And we'll be beginning at the 10th verse. The whole subject basically is about action, karma. And therefore, logically, the, the title of the chapter is the yoga of renunciation of actions. In other words, it's a lot of people do things disinterestedly, but the yogi does it so that it will further his own evolution and facilitate his actual practice of yoga. So, speaking of the wise person, it says, offering actions to Brahman, having abandoned attachment, he acts untainted by evil as a lotus leaf is not wetted by water because water runs off the, the leaf of the lotus the way it does over, say, a very slick or an oily surface. So the secret is simply this. I mean, in other words, how does he do it? It is that there are two, you and I have two senses of self-awareness. One is ahamkara, I amness. Ahamkara is of the lower mind of the ego. It is materially oriented and selfishly oriented. But there is another eye sense, which even God has, which is asmita, the sense of not aham, but asmi. I've cited several times how in the beginning, the Supreme Being said, Soham asmi. I am Soham. When the aham, the lower ego, the lower self is involved, then the karma is binding and detrimental. When asmita, the sense, the high sense of I am is present, then the actions not only do not bind, but they free. Uh, we'll be coming to that in a moment. All right. Karma yogis perform action only with the body, mind, intellect, or the senses, forsaking attachment. In other words, he doesn't do it with the ahankar, with the aham. Forsaking attachment, performing action for self-purification. It isn't even just, well, I want to be noble and have people think I'm noble. Right action, positive karma, counteracts and dissolves negative karma. And that's a purification, a profound purification. So this is uh, an incredibly important subject and an important point here. He who is steadfast, having abandoned actions for that is in his mind, because of course it's going to occur, attains lasting peace. Because he's not pushed around by I like, I don't like, I want, I don't want, he is aware that his whole life is pointed toward a supreme and high goal, which is liberation. Liberation from bondage into the freedom of the infinite spirit. Renouncing all actions with the mind, because that's where it happens. The embodied one sits happily and contentedly 
as the ruler of the city of nine gates, not acting at all, nor causing action. That is, the lower part is not acting and is not pushing him to action, causing action. Now, the nine gates, uh, the sort of externalized yogis say, well, you have, you know, openings in the body, nine, and that's what is meant. But the yogis don't mean that. Therefore, Krishna being a supreme yogi is called Yogeshwara, the Ishwara of yogis. He's talking like a yogi. We have in our subtle makeup nine primary centers of power. They are both centers of power from which subtle spiritual shaktis emanate and also centers where the subtle higher energies can accumulate. So it's like a well. You pump the water out of the well, but the forces in the earth push more water up in the well. And these centers are the nine chakras that are worked with in yoga sadhana, or perhaps more than worked with, they are affected because the Soham yogi knows how by Awakening the spiritual consciousness in the Sahasra, the thousand petal lotus, which corresponds, which in the body is the brain, that there are, there, as I say, there are, there are nine. There are two that are not usually known. Usually you evolve here are seven chakras and you get pictures of seven chakras. But there are two others that the yogi really understands and the non-yogis don't even know as a rule exist. One is the Talu chakra. The Talu chakra is at the root of the palate. Like if you put your tongue up on uh, the roof of your mouth, well, it's hard. But if you move it back further, it becomes soft. All right. Well, Two or three inches, I better not try to talk and put my tongue there at the same time. Uh, that's where the chakra is. And you see, the energies flow up through the lesser chakras, the lower chakras. And when it gets to the Vishuddha chakra, which is also behind us, with, with many yogis, it gets stuck. And yogis say, well, I, I get the subtle energies up to the throat and they don't go any higher. I remember there was a yogi like this uh, staying in Saptarishi Ashram in Harbar when I was staying there. And he even asked uh, for Anandamai Ma to come and visit him and talk with him about these things. And one of his problems was that it was stuck. Well, that's because the Talu chakra has not been prepared to receive the energies and hand it on or transmit it on then to the Ajna chakra at the point between the eyebrows. But when it is prepared and energized or awakened, then the energies come up the spine, they go through the Talu chakra, they come here, and then they go to another chakra that yogis don't know about, ordinary yogis don't know about, and that's called the nirvana chakra. Well, that's really important. Nirvana is a state of realization. It's also called the jalandhara chakra. A jalandhara means holder of the net. The net can be considered in two ways. The subtle net or inner working of astral psychic energies that are in the thousand metal lotus. And then the whole network of the pranas 
and the nadis, who which pranas flow, in the whole body. But this controls it. And when this is activated, then all these energies are easily put in one upward direction, orientation. And then it goes from the tallow, it goes there, and then there. And then the operation of the whole subtle energy systems of the yogi is complete and perfect and in exact right order. A lot of our problems come from our the various energies, the various products, simply getting out of our control and wandering away to where uh, they don't belong. So this is a really important thing to understand, what the nine are actually. And really only the not yogis know this. Other yogis may have read something of theirs and copied it because it sounded exotic to say, ho, ho, you think there are only seven chakras. I happen to know by my great realization that there are nine. But this is specifically the knowledge of the not yogis whose soul practice is soham sadhana, soham yoga. The Lord does not create either means of action or action itself in this world, nor the union of action with its fruit. Well, what does then? Not just the ego. But God from on high doesn't say, all right, here's this machine, work it and work it well. No. All of these things are called into being when we are being formed in the womb and which are empowered, especially after we've come from the womb, grown to a rational age where we can learn to be a yogi and then have that energization, that impulse, to go on into higher consciousness. On the other hand, the swabhava impels one to action. That is, when everything is straightened out, your self-nature, bhava is nature, mind, cast of mind, orientation of mind, quality of mind, direction of mind, all that. That's the bhava. And when it's a swabhava, it means all of this of us, all these aspects are like mirrors, which are reflecting the source of, of themselves. The swa, the self. And so the swabhava, which is the consciousness and the awareness of the self, then that leads us into free action, not because it's our karma we have to do it, not because somebody else told us we have to do it, not just because intellectually we thought it'd be the good idea to do it, it's because the self comes in and says, from now on, I'm in charge. Now that doesn't mean there's some personality other than you and I, it means we completely open up. At night we sleep, we dream, we're who knows or what, what kind of a person, or even if, if it's a human form. But when we wake up, there's the one that was there before we went to sleep. So what we were before we came into the world of sleep, into the world of relative existence, is still there and is awake in the deep inner levels, but it comes on to the conscious level and it is running all things and it is all pervading and it is in our life as yogis, omnipresent. 
present in everything. The omnipresent takes note of neither merit nor, nor demerit. Good karma doesn't mean anything. Bad karma doesn't mean anything. Not to the absolute spirit. Then what gets us in trouble? Knowledge, jnana, that's spiritual insight, spiritual wisdom, not just facts like you know, there's how many oceans in the world and how many continents. Knowledge is enveloped by ignorance. As a result of that, people are deluded because their mind is totally clouded. And if, if someone put a blindfold on us and then someone could take us by the hand and say, well, I'll lead you. And we'll just have to go wherever they take us because we can't see where we're going. Well, they could take us anywhere. They could lead us up to the top of a mountain and say, okay, go forward. We go forward. Down we fall. Crash. That's the end of that incarnation. So <clears throat> it is this Atmagyana, self-knowledge. Its presence gives us freedom from illusion and its absence gives us the presence, bondage of illusion. But those in whom this ignorance of the self has been destroyed by knowledge, and that's the only one that does it. In other words, uh, I'm looking around. I've got a timer here. Where's my timer? Where's my timer? I can't see it. I can't find it. Well, virtue is lost to me. If somebody says, look, there it is. I say, oh, yes, there it is. And it's good. I saw it. It reminds me I only have about three minutes left. So that knowledge of theirs, because it's not God's knowledge that has shined down upon us and God illuminated us. Oh, great guru touched me and then I awoke, you see. None of that foolishness. It's our knowledge, our inner illumination reveals the Supreme Brahman. The knowledge itself Guruji does not. God does not. God isn't hiding, so God isn't there to say, whoops, peekaboo, here am I. No. It's we've been keeping our eyes closed all the time. And then we open them and we see. And we open them because it's our nature for those eyes to be opened. And therefore, we've somewhat completed that subject. So, namaste until our next talk, when we will take it up again.